This is Julie Cooper, a mystery and thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you a regular podcast series, Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. Uh, We're waiting to introduce our mystery guest, but first I'd like to give thanks to my brother Chris Squires for his original composition and performance of our theme song, The Man in the Panama Hat. And now I know Wendy's anxiously waiting in the wings to introduce our writer, and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Julie. I am cozy crazy, but I love all kinds of mysteries. And these days, I'm savoring the idea that variety is the spice of life. That's part of what I love about the mystery genre. I like trying different approaches to a good story. I won't give up my beloved cozies. And sometimes I have to push myself to go outside my comfort zone and venture into other plots and styles and characters. It sort of makes me think of that scene in My Best Friend's Wedding when Julia Roberts debates creme brulee and jello with Cameron Diaz. You're Michael. You're in a fancy French restaurant. You order creme brulee for dessert. It's beautiful. It's sweet. It's irritatingly perfect. Suddenly, Michael realizes he doesn't want creme brulee. He wants something else. What does he want? Jello. Well, Julie, I want to feast at the full mystery buffet. Sometimes I want creme brulee mysteries, and sometimes I want jello cozies. And sometimes I want thrillers, and so on. Our guest author today features a quote on her website that inspires adventure in writers and readers. You cannot discover new worlds unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Laura DiSilverio, find her online at lauradisilverio.com, where you'll see her wide variety of mysteries cozies with her readaholics mysteries, mall cop mysteries, ballroom dance mysteries, southern beauty shop mysteries, and the P.I. swift investigation mysteries, and more. But as you say, Wendy, she's written very successful mystery types of many varieties, Suspense with the Reckoning Stones, Young Adult Trilogy, and her biography shows great variety in her personal life as well. In fact, of all the mystery writers I think we've interviewed to date, Laura de Silverio probably writes the widest variety of mysteries. So we'll be asking more about that. But first, welcome, Laura. Hi, guys. Thanks very much for inviting me to join you today. Our pleasure. Laura, I'm going to dive right in. I'm thinking book clubs are such a wonderful way to make an individual activity of reading instead a very social activity. I'm sure many of our listeners are book club members and can relate enthusiastically to your Readaholics series and the wonderful group of book club friends featured. Are these fun characters inspired by a book club you know? And can you speak a little about book clubs and sharing books? Well, you know, strangely enough, given that I write a series about the women in a book club, I've never been in a book club, you know, in in recent memory myself, I suppose I might have been in one in college or something. Um, I I think that's largely because I like to look at books and dissect them from the point of view of a writer. And a couple of the book clubs that I've, you know, looked into becoming part of have been more interested in sort of uh, discussing the social issues or, or whatever might come in the book nothing wrong with that at all it's a it's a wonderful thing to do and i'm i'm so happy to see the proliferation of book clubs these days but that's just not um you know my main my main interest in in talking about books most of the time however i do love to go and chat with book clubs i get invited to speak with them about my books with some frequency and i get all my best uh, book reading suggestions from the book clubs that i go to visit well in the readaholics and the Poirot puzzle, 
The club is reading Murder on the Orient Express and discussing the surprising resolution, and then they apply some of what they discuss to try to solve a murder mystery that occurs close to home. As your characters analyze their clues and relate them to mysteries they've read, as a reader, I feel like I'm a member of that book club. What is it in your writing that gets your readers so involved? Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that you got involved. That's certainly always my goal. Um, I think largely it's because I try to make the characters realistic. I try to make them people that you might know, you might work with, they might be neighbors, they might be people that you're in a book club with. They're not um, geniuses, they're not perfect. Um, each of them has their own flaws, each of them has their own kind of foibles and twitches. Um, some of them are funny, but they're, they're all kind of trying hard to be their best person and to be good friends to each other and to, um, you know, in the case of the readaholic, certainly to, to read good books and, and have good discussions about them. So hopefully that's why people, readers, um, feel involved with that particular set of characters. That is such a fun group. When the readaholics in the Falcon fiasco, when that begins, you have an energetic event planner character, Amy Faye Johnson, and she's on her way to meet a new client. And she's looking so great and professional. She's all set for a perfect day. <laughs> and then on her drive, things begin to deteriorate. And then the client holds some disturbing surprises. And then Amy Faye ends up accidentally immersed in the most humiliating circumstances. And that all of that is just chapter one. <laughs> it's all uh, so discouraging and also highly relatable. Can you talk a little about your motives in hurling all these difficulties and stress your character's way? I mean, Laura, is this your idea of fun? <laughs> Or does this, no. <laughs> does this have to do with, uh, when I was at a Sisters in Crime event, luckily you were the speaker, and you talked about conflict being necessary and integral. So can you tell me why you put your characters through these things? <laughs> well, I, I put them through for a number of reasons, not because I think it's fun. Uh, uh, partly because I think you you can see the essence of a character very quickly and how they respond to conflict. Um, whereas if they're just going along in a completely routine day and everything's going well, you don't learn a lot about them. Um, you know, we, we show our true colors when things get stressful, right? Um, and and also, as as you say, I think conflict is necessary to the plot. It's what and, and to character development, it's what draws readers in. Um, so I kind of try to layer in different kinds of conflict, both to draw the reader in and to help them see who the characters really are. Um, I did have a similar circumstance myself once when I was in the Air Force. You know, Amy Fay has the, the wardrobe disaster that you're kind of alluding to in the in the first chapter. And when I was a, a very young lieutenant in the Air Force, um, I accidentally, and I won't go into the hows and whys of it, just just believe me when I tell you it made total sense and was unavoidable, but I accidentally <laughs> um, started into work up the sidewalk after parking my car in my uniform and a pair of pink pumps instead of my black pumps. <laughs> and as if that, but yeah. Yeah, and people are giving me funny looks, you know, as if it, that weren't bad enough. You know, I look down and I realize, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm wearing pink shoes and I turn around to go back to my car and find the black ones and I run smack into a Marine general. <laughs> oh. And, and I salute smartly and say, you know, good morning, general. And he says very doubtfully, good morning, lieutenant. <laughs> and I just keep on going right past him. Um, he doesn't call me back and chew me out or anything. And I think, okay, dodged a bullet there. 
Uh, only I get up to my office and find out that he was friends with my boss. And, and they've all been having a good laugh about it um, before I even get into work. Oh, oh no. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took me quite a while to live that one down. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, talking about the military a little bit, your SWIFT investigation series features a PI who's an ex-Air Force investigator. So now, in this series, your investigator isn't an amateur sleuth. What are some of the challenges writing a PI series as opposed to a COSY? I actually think that PI series is easier in a lot of ways. Um, with a cozy, you have to convince the readers that, you know, Jane Doe, average citizen, um, or I guess John Doe, but mostly they're, they're women in the cozies, uh, just catapults herself into the middle of a murder investigation, which most of us, I'm, you know, going to venture out on a limb and say probably wouldn't do. Um, and not, not only does person the amateur sleuth do this once but if it's a successful and long-running series they do this time and time and time and time and time and time, <laughs> and time again yes whereas you know if you have a pi character they're being paid you know there's someone is coming to them it doesn't have to be one of their friends or relatives killing over dead you know with poison or a knife in the back <laughs> um you know somebody is coming to the pi in a professional capacity and saying hey you know find out what happened to my sister or you know my husband disappeared three weeks ago and you know the police don't believe he, he's dead but i know he is you know whatever whatever the circumstances might be and uh -huh. so the the pi is in it for cold hard cash which to my mind is generally a more believable motive um than than your average amateur sleuth has for leaping into an investigation Interesting. Are there challenges as well with the PI? I mean, what is it that's difficult about writing those? I mean, if you're going to make them realistic, I, I think one of the challenges that probably applies to both is the relationship with the police. Um, you know, PIs aren't really supposed to be investigating current homicides for the most part. That's a police job. And um, you know, same thing for amateurs. They, you know, how much does the individual then share with the police? Because I have to think that most of us reasonable human beings, if we found a, a pretty good clue, I couldn't take it to the police. We're not going to go down in the dark basement on our own or, you know, trekking, <laughs> trekking across the frozen tundra, you know, tracking the serial killer, um, as so many sleuths seem to do. So I, I think that's, that's a challenge in both. How do you make it realistic in terms of the police interaction? And also a challenge in both is how do you give your private investigator or your amateur sleuth information to the kind of, uh, or not access to the information that they need, like fingerprint results or DNA results or um, whatever was in the MasterCard records or the cell phone records of the victim. I mean, that's information that the police can get very easily. And, you know, frequently you'll have a cop character who, for one reason or another, tends to share that with the amateur sleuth or the PI. Oh, that's an interesting insight. Yeah, I see that. Uh, in Close Call, your book Close Call, your courageous character, Sydney Ellison, she starts down a deadly path due to a chance encounter picking up a stranger's phone instead of her own by accident. And Sydney makes me think of Nelson Mandela's quoted definition of courage. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. Can you talk a little about your Sydney character and some of her flaws that she's accumulated from her life experiences and then how she has to face those? Yeah, I mean, Sydney is, is kind of close to my heart because I think a lot of her flaws accumulate 
from one bad decision she made when she was 19 years old and she had a an affair with a with the speaker of the house so you know kind of think monica Lewinsky there um and of course that was very public and the media made a big deal out of it and you know it changed her life and how many of us um you know have have made that one bad decision that could have changed our lives you know in many cases maybe maybe it did but i think a lot of us got got lucky and the the bad decision or maybe we made more than one um, <laughs> yes you know the, the bad decision did not completely change our lives so you know i kind of go phew you know there but for the grace of god go i but sydney got unlucky and it changed her life and it um you know damaged her relationships it made her made her less willing to trust in relationships uh you know i don't want to give away one of the plot twists but um you know the way that this came to the attention of the media was a betrayal on the part of someone that, that she cared about and um you know, and she's had to live her life under the scrutiny of the media, and that's made her very, very slow to trust, and obviously very reluctant to to stand up and and perhaps attract media attention again. And so she makes, you know, I guess another another bad decision when she finds out that there's um, a potential assassination going to occur. She doesn't immediately go to the police because she's afraid of being laughed at and afraid of being called in you know, uh, an attention seeker and, you know, tragic circumstances ensue because of her reluctance there. And that's when she, she finally gets her backbone back and says, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to do whatever is necessary to resolve this situation now. It is interesting how that life experience really, like you say, it colors her future decisions. It's, it's just, it's fascinating to read. It, well, thank you. I like the word fascinating when applied to my books. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing about your mystery close call that, that it really jumped out at me is that that book, it seems like the story belongs just as much to your character, Paul, who's the assassin, as it does to Sydney. Can you talk a little about Paul and why you wanted to give him such a platform? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say it was just as much. Um, you know, Sydney Sydney's the one whose main character arc we follow and who does you know, most of the changing and what have you over the course of the book. Um, but I wanted him to be a real a real person. I wanted Paul, even though he's an assassin and it's not like I'm trying to make him a hero. Um, I just wanted to humanize him and help readers see him as a person who has an aging father with dementia problems. And, and maybe he's, he's thinking about getting involved in a romance and not quite sure how that's going to mesh with his current career as an assassin. <laughs> and, um, you know, realize that, that he's got, you know, we all come to crossroads in our lives and, um, you know, I don't want to talk about him retiring in the sense that, you know, you would retire from a corporate job or the military or something, but you know, we all have to come to that realization someday that, that maybe our skills for whatever, whether it's assassination or tennis, are you know, not quite what they used to be. Um, I don't know. I just thought it, it added an interesting dimension to the story, which is why, you know, I made him a point of point of view character it was really interesting and I, I when I was reading it it just added so much more for me as a reader to get things from his point of view rather than have other people sort of describe him or talk about him I, I just thought that was a um, really a thrilling way to to bring that end of the story really to life for me as a reader I, I really like that uh, Thank you. Sometimes in your writing, I think <laughs> that I'm seeing just kind of a little shadow of Laura Di Silverio. <laughs> For example, in Close Call, and maybe I'm off on this, but in Close Call, your protagonist, Sydney, is sitting in this one scene in a Washington, D.C. arboretum and thinking about how 
As a teenager, she'd spent many an hour in the Asian Valley or the herb garden, scribbling in her diary and enjoying the tranquility woven by the trees, plants, and water features. Can you talk a little bit about that scene? Is that a glimpse into Laura as a teenager? <laughs> yeah, yeah when, when, I, when I read this question, I knew you were going to ask about it. And unfortunately, no, this is just an off-the-cuff little... You, threw it in as I was writing and typing and it just kind of appeared. Um, I was, you know, not much of a diary keeper. Um, yeah, I had two younger brothers. Keeping a diary would probably have been a very uh, unwise thing to do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I certainly will admit that there are glimpses of Laura in all of my books. I mean, all of it comes out of my head. So there, there are certainly glimpses of me. I, I just don't think this one is particularly it, although I do love the Washington, D.C. Arboretum. Uh, if there's not a crowd around, I think it's a, just a lovely, relaxing spot. Well, you definitely brought it to a, a very vivid visual in my mind in that scene. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Your young adult incubation trilogy is far out of my personal reading comfort zone. And yet, when I moved ahead to try it, I found that I got completely caught up in the action, the characters. Can you talk a little about what inspired you to write this thought-provoking trilogy? Well, you know, I've got two teenage girls, and for years and years, since I started writing professionally or getting published professionally, we all know those are different timelines, um, they've been wanting me to write a YA book. And I said, well, I don't have any YA ideas. If I had a YA idea... I would, I would write a YA book, um, you know, for the readers who, who might not be in on the lingo, YA would be young adult. Um, but fi finally, you know, a couple years ago, I found myself just thinking about this world and it started building itself in my mind. Um, and it turned out to be the, the world of Amarada, you know, set at the end of this set century in a U.S. that's been decimated by disease and then famine um, and the need to rebuild the population. And, and my mind just started playing what ifs, you know, what if we needed to rebuild the population? How would we do that? And uh, would we, you know, would the government be in a position to force women to have babies? And wow, you know, we would probably want to make sure we had the kind of, um, Babies that would grow up to be people who could contribute to the society in ways that, you know, that possibly a very repressive government might think were more important. You know, nobody needs, nobody needs a novelist, right? We need somebody, a civil engineer who can build roads. Who needs a novelist? There you go. Um, and it went, went on from there. And so that's, that was kind of the genesis of that series. And of course, once the world had, has started forming in my mind, um, I began to think about characters and Everly and Hala and, and Wick, the three, the three protagonists, um, began to develop as well in their relationship and, and their flaws and what it is they wanted most in life and kind of the barriers that stand be stood between achieving that. Um, and you know, three, three books, poof, 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 you know, they just kind of, just kind of all came together. It was, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, I should have actually the, the audio of the first book, Incubation. Um, there's, a a, an actor working on that as we speak. So hopefully end of this month or not, not March, end of April, I'm hoping that the audiobook of that will be available. Oh, that would be a great way to hear that story. That's amazing. That would be great. Oh, and if you, and if you speak French, I just saw, signed a contract last week with a French publisher for the French language rights to that trilogy, um, to the first two books in the trilogy. So that will be coming out in France and parts of Canada, at least, um, later this year. Exciting. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I've heard you speak about how the writer should have a specific goal in mind for each scene that's included in a story. Can you tell us what kinds of goals can a scene have? 
But I think you have to look at the goals from two perspectives. One, the author should have a goal for what he or she wants to accomplish in that scene. So, you know, I, I might be, I want to show a character trait. You know, I want to show that that protagonist is vulnerable. I want to show that that protagonist has an anger management issue. Um, or maybe I want to reveal a specific piece of, of the character's backstory. Um, so those would be what I would think of as the author's goals. But then you also need to have character goals in that scene. So if we're talking mysteries, uh, maybe the character's goal is to find out if the suspect has an alibi or, you know, if it's, um, you know, an interpersonal relationship kind of thing, maybe the character wants to talk someone into going home to bed with her, or um, a character wants to teach a lesson to her child. Um, so you're, as a writer, you're always thinking on both those levels, and how can you mesh them to accomplish both your goal as an author and, um, you know, give the character a goal on the page, whether or not he or she accomplishes it. Because, of course, we talked earlier about got to have that conflict. So more often than not, my poor characters don't get to accomplish their goal in a scene, at least not the first time around. <laughs> I love that. I love that idea that the author can have different goals for a scene than the characters have. I just love that. That is very cool. <laughs> Uh, I, and I'd like to talk about the Reckoning Stones. Part of the mystery of the Reckoning sto Stones is loyalty. Yeah, it's just something. Um, there's exception. There's expectations of loyalty. There's misguided loyalty, and and there's even more ways that you write about loyalty in the Reckoning Stones. Can you tell us the ways that you're conveying this powerful emotion in your writing? Um, you know, rel relative to the Reckoning Stones, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it in terms of loyalty before, but, you know, I, I completely see that. That's one of the reasons that, that it's so exciting when a book goes out into the world instead of just living in my head and my computer, because then I get this kind of reaction or feedback, and I, and I realize that sometimes it says, um, you know, the different readers get, get something out of it that I may not have intended on a conscious level. Um, so that's that's always fascinating to me. Um, but yes, you know, there, there's a lot about loyalty in there. Loyalty to family, um, loyalty to God, because there's a community, a very religious community in this book. Um, and, you know, people who have their experience of, of religion as a community, and pretty much only as a community, versus people who have some sort of spirituality and and loyalty to God or relationship with God that is more individual. Um, and then there's a very powerful force uh, about loyalty to this community, um, even above and beyond, in some cases, the individual's best interests or the interests of the people they love. And I think that's um, a powerful dynamic in the story. I really got caught up in that and uh, in the story and I, I, there were other of course this this book is amazing so I, there's there's all kinds of other dimensions to it as well but I really got caught up in this and and sort of the whole perspective of what one person's sense of loyalty is may be a sense of betrayal for somebody else's perspective so yeah yeah, I thought it was amazing. Uh, there's there's several characters in that novel that are wrestling with regrets. How do you get to know your characters so well that you even know their innermost regrets? Well, in, in this book, um, yeah, I almost kind of started with the regrets um, before I ever, you know, put the first word on the page. Obviously, I do a lot of thinking and developing of, of my characters. And I wanted to start from a place of regret um, with, with many of these characters. I mean, obviously Iris, uh, my protagonist, also her mother, I mean, her parents, 
um, I wanted to be you know, very regretful of you know the the big incident that that occurs that basically splits their family apart. I mean, unless you're a sociopath, how can you not regret you know, driving your 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 only daughter away? Um, and if you're that daughter, how can you not regret, even if you think you're completely justified in leaving and that you have, you know, that your parents or your family or your community have done you wrong, how can you not regret, um, you know, tearing yourself out of, of those relationships? Um, you know, sometimes it's necessary, but I think there, there's always going to be an underlying regret to that. So, I kind of started from that place of regret and tried to ask for each character, what would reconciliation look like? What would redemption look like? Because I think we find our ways to redemption, if it's possible um, at all, differently. You know, in, in this in this book, for instance, Marion, Iris's mother, he was kind of trying to work her way to redemption. She's trying to serve the community and do, you know, concrete acts, things we can observe. Um, and like, like you can buy redemption that way that even though you've done someone wrong, if you then do enough good things, it can make up for it. And, and there are other characters in the book. Um, well, there's some who, clearly are not not too concerned about redemption at all they're very <laughs> caught up in in what it is they want and they continue to focus on that and iris i think is more kind of surprised by redemption you know and ends up asking the question um you know not can i work my way to redemption so much but you know maybe it's maybe it's just a gift um maybe if you open yourself up to it um you know, you can you can be redeemed, and relationships can find healing, and so it, that's that's kind of how I approached this book, starting with the regret and then working forwards and backwards and sideways to see where the characters would go from that place. Well, the way that that those journeys for those characters become sort of unraveled and, and revealed to the reader throughout this book is just so skillful. I, I mean, I was just glued to it. it. Thank you. The Reckoning Stones is really about a cold case mystery at the, at the core of it. What are the advantages and disadvantages of writing about a cold case? Yeah, that's that's kind of tricky. I mean, it's um, yeah. I don't know that there are a whole lot of advantages. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the disadvantages, of course, are are that you know, your suspects or the people, your witnesses, could be dead. Um, they can have dementia. They can have moved to Shanghai. Um, <laughs> you know, and in the real world, I mean, that's that's kind of what happens. Uh, memory, which is at best, you know, even immediately after some sort of, of crime, um, at best is, is, you know, a very fickle and not very reliable um, force, you know, can, can be warped by the intervening years and conversations and relationships and what have you. So I think it gets very difficult uh, to unravel what actually happened. Um, and from a practical perspective, from the writer's perspective here, it becomes very hard to build a plausible um, investigation. It, it's very, it's just interesting how that works. But, you know, Laura, I know that our listeners would love hearing you read from one of your books. W would you treat us to a little reading today? Sure, I would be happy to. I thought maybe what I would read, if you guys agree, is from my current work in progress, oh, which... yeah. <laughs> yeah, which... <laughs> except it's not a mystery. Uh, there are no dead bodies in this book. Uh -oh. I wasn't sure I wasn't <laughs> sure I could write a book with no dead bodies, but um, 
you know, it's gone really well. I've got 85,000 words. The first draft is almost done. And unless I have to kill off someone on the last page, I'm going to make it all the way through with, with no homicides. Um, all right. My, the book is, my curiosity is peaked. <laughs> Mine too. I'd love to hear this. Yeah, it, it's called The Empty Nesters Club. And it's about uh, the three women and one stay-at-home dad who all more or less simultaneously send their only or their uh, last child off to college. And it's about their relationships and sort of the way they individually cope with this. Um, the one woman who's, who's seen, I'll be reading you, she's kind of the helicopter parent. She has lived her, the last 18 years of her life through and for her children. So this is a huge cataclysmic event for her. Um, one of the other women, it's her fourth child that's going off to school and she's woohoo, you know, I get the house to myself. Thank goodness. You know, yeah. don't, don't come, don't come back. <laughs> um, and, the uh, the man, the stay at home dad has been taking care of his kids for the 18 years. He's not been working outside the home. His wife is an airline pilot. And as after they drop their daughter off at college, she says, Oh, and by the way, just drop me at the airport. Cause I'm leaving you. Oh. And, um, so kind of a role reversal thing there. She's a pilot. She's been having an affair with a flight attendant, which we don't learn till much later in the book. Shh, I'm, I'm counting on everybody, all the listeners to forget that by the time they actually get to read this book. Um, <laughs> cause it won't be out till 2018 sometime. Um, and then the, the other woman has been a, a career woman. She's been a single parent. She's had to work, you know, at times more than one job to keep a roof over her and her son's heads. And and so as he leaves her college, she realizes that she doesn't have the relationship with him she wishes she did, that she wasn't able to spend as much time with him as she wanted. And so she's dealing with regrets um, about the way she's lived with her life and wondering if she can find a different way to connect with him. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the setup for the book. And I will just read you a, a little bit from the, the first chapter. So it says, um, this is move in day. Even though her sinuses prickled like someone had crammed a cactus inside them, Samantha refused to cry. Not yet. Not in front of Nick, who would be embarrassed and feel sad for her, which would take the bloom off his excitement. Not in front of Nick's new sweet mate and his well-fed Midwestern parents who were busily stocking the freezer with casseroles they'd brought all the way from Muncie. Samantha had to give the mom big points for that. Not in front of the RA, a ruthlessly perky junior who stopped by to remind the incoming freshman of a mandatory floor meeting in half an hour. Parents have to be gone by four, she chirped with what Samantha couldn't help but think was malice. Let me just finish making the bed. Samantha hurried from the sweet, small common area, past a room with a poster of Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman on the door, past the empty room of the third sweet maid who wasn't arriving till tomorrow, and into the room that would be Nick's man cave, as he insisted on calling it, for the next year. She'd already unpacked his clothes and stowed them in the dresser and closet. His toiletries were arranged by height on the shelf above the sink. The bathroom proper was a communal affair located down the hall. Undoubtedly gross. Cleats, bats, and a baseball glove spilled from the duffel he plunked in the corner. The textbooks they'd purchased that morning formed a leaning tower on his desk, thick and glossy and not worth anything like the $648 they'd paid. Sunlight streamed through the window with its view of the quad, an acre of green crisscrossed with walkways and dotted with mature trees. Sounds of conversation, horn beeps, and hip-hop music drifted in the open window. Blinking rapidly, Samantha flapped the sheet, gray in case he forgot to wash his linens regularly or ever and let it settle on the lofted bed a few tucks later she was plumping the pillow and sliding it sliding under it the note she'd written him and a bag of the twizzlers he loved but that she never let him eat because they rotted his teeth tears threatened again and she blocked them with a forefinger under each eye she didn't need mascara tracks tattling on her Pasting a smile on her face, she returned to the common area where Nick and his sweet mate were talking baseball like they'd known each other since grade school instead of for less than an hour, and the parents were chatting stiltedly with Jeff. He eyed her with concern, and she broadened her smile, knowing it didn't fool him for one second. We should say goodbye to Holly and get going, Jeff said, sidestepping toward the open door. Holly was Nick's twin, and her suite was across the hall and two doors down from Nick's. 
They'd spent the morning getting her settled. Samantha nodded, not trusting herself to speak. To cover the heartbreak that threatened to swamp her, she pulled some papers from her capacious purse and magneted them to the fridge with the university logoed magnets she bought at the campus store. Your class schedule, she said, affixing one page to the fridge. Your final schedule, she secured that one. Dining hall hours, don't forget what cheese does to your digestive system. Mom, Nick winced. Sam, Jeff touched her arm. She sniffled. A break in the dam. Could the full waterworks be far behind? She needed to get out of here. I know. I'm sorry. I'm coming. She looked at Nick, her beautiful golden boy. He was taller than she by a good six inches, tanned and blonde and so young. He hugged her, overwhelming her with his familiar scent, mostly buried under that obnoxious body spray he had applied as if it were mosquito repellent and he was at risk of contracting malaria. She wanted to clutch at him, to hold him close for hours, but she had a little pride and a shred of common sense remaining. She didn't want him wriggling away from her like he had at preschool drop-off when she hugged him too long. It seemed like only a handful of years since she'd lifted him and Holly down from their booster seats and walked them into the Rocky Mountain Montessori School. She broke away, blinking. See you soon, Mom, he said, turning back to his sweet mate in baseball talk, as if the world wasn't turned on its head by the fact that he and Holly were moving out, as if the sun and moon hadn't stopped in their tracks for all intents and purposes, as if as if her heart weren't being ripped from her chest and trampled on by a stampeding herd of sharp-hoofed wildebeest. That enough, or do you want more? Oh, I think that's great. That's beautiful. And I think you've taken us, Laura, to a place where so many parents have been. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be an empty nester in August. So, you know, they say, write what you know, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you can bring some fresh emotion to that, certainly. I have a question for you. It's very clear you've written in such a wide variety of mystery-related directions. And my question was, what's next for you? But I think with that last reading, I think you've sort of answered that question for us. Laura, is this going to be a new direction for fiction that you're producing from now on? Is things without dead bodies? <laughs> we'll see. Um, the book that comes out this September has has dead bodies. It's called That Last Weekend. Um and that, that's out, like I said, the September of 2017. I'm almost done with the first draft of Empty Nesters Club, which is you know, going to be a, a women's fiction title. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see, um, you know, what, what the ideas are that come to my head. Actually, the, the book I'll be working on after, after Empty Nesters Club is kind of another, um, well, it's a cold case and a, and a modern day case. It is another... It is another suspense novel um, with a with a tie in to the Jonestown massacre as a kind of a historical element running through it. Ah, okay. So I'll I'll be returning to mystery for that at least. But you know, I had a heck of a fun time writing the YA trilogy. Um, wouldn't mind at all doing more of that um, if if there turns out to be some money in it. And you know, ditto for the women's fiction. I. I really had, um, it was very meaningful to me to write a lot of, to, to write large parts of this book. And I, I liked having to present people with conflicts, life conflicts that didn't involve murder, you know, because that's so far outside of, of what most of us experience. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's a fun writing experience. It's a, it's a fun escapist reading experience, but for the most part, it's not what we deal with in our daily lives. And, and so it was just kind of, um, yeah, fun's not really the word. I mean, I do have fun when I write, but it was very fulfilling in a lot of ways to write about these four friends and their relationships and not have to work in a mystery and not have to work in, you know, suspect interviews and following the clues and trying to sort it all out. Just kind of watch these people muddle through their real lives uh, in hopefully an amusing and some, you know, sometimes amusing and and entertaining way. Right, right, great. Okay, so my follow-up question to you is, is there one type of mystery, suspense, or thriller that you honestly feel you could never write, whether it would be historical yeah. or noir, or is there one that you just couldn't, don't think you could deal with? I don't ever see myself doing a serial killer kind of thing. Um, for one thing, I think the, the actual existence of serial killers is, is much rarer than than 
mystery crime fiction would lead one to believe. Um, and I don't find, I just, I just don't find it that interesting. Uh, the focus tends to be far too much on the crimes themselves. Um, I don't know. It, it, just, it just doesn't appeal to me. And I, I don't see myself writing a revenge kind of novel. I, I, I think revenge is one of the least likely and um, less interesting motives across the board, especially these revenge things that supposedly percolate for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, before the wronged individual goes about getting his or her revenge. So I don't, I don't see myself ever, ever headed in that direction either. Okay. All right. Well, admittedly, you have a very diverse range as a writer from, as Wendy mentioned, the Rita Hollicks to the Southern Beauty Shop Mysteries to the Charlie Swift series with a professional professional investigator. And my question to you is when you're starting into writing a book, do you know right off the top what that book's going to be? Or yeah, does it veer, veer into something else sometimes? When you say what it's going to be, do you mean genre-wise? Uh, yes. Do you yeah, start writing I, I, something and the characters come to you and then you think, oh, well, this is going to be more toward the cozy or this is going to be more toward the, the PI investigator direction? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm pretty uh, pretty set with what it's going to be before I start writing it. For one thing, frequently there's a contract before I start writing it and, and the publisher wants something specific. You know, I can't start a, a cozy series under contract and decide halfway through, huh, yeah, let me let me throw in a pedophile. Um, right, right. You know, let me let me kill off a couple of cats. Um, you know, <laughs> just just not gonna go over with the the publisher or the reading public in a cozy format. Um, so yeah, I I wouldn't say there's ever been a time where I started out thinking the genre was one thing and then changed it halfway through. Okay, all right, and. Speaking of characters in your books, do your characters, when you're writing away, do they ever surprise you? Because I know on occasion mine do, and I think, why on earth did I write that? Why would they do something like that? And then when I sort of trace the threads back to their backstory, I realize, oh, this is actually perfectly logical in some ways, given where this character came from. But I'm wondering... Do your characters surprise you, even though it sounds like you're very much a planner and, and pretty pretty um, methodical in terms of what you think is going to happen throughout the book? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not really necessarily. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not a, um, a hardcore outliner. I have outlined some books, but I've done some books completely, you know, organically. Um, but yeah, sometimes my characters surprise me. Um, in the first draft of close call the character of Reese um, who is Sydney's sister she was she was an investigative reporter but she was a very 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 minor character who didn't play much of a role in the story at all and she just wasn't content with that she's a nope she's she wanted a much bigger part in the in the investigation and um, you know, she made me realize that she's the one that had the investigative skills. She was an investigative reporter. So why would she not be involved in, you know, tracking down um, this contract killer? So her role grew from, you know, a very couple of very minor scenes to, you know, significant enough that I have readers asking me if I'm going to do a sequel where she's the main character. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. And I know we have many writers, both beginning writers and established writers who listen to our podcast. Do you have a writing craft book that's been especially influential that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, you know, I think writing craft books, just like writing workshops and, and what have you, um, different ones. Ones are useful to different writers at different points in their journey. How many times sure. can I work the word different into that sentence? <laughs> um, the ones that I, I find myself going back to the most frequently, there's, there's a book called Writing for Emotional Impact by a man named Carl Iglesias. 
I and I think it's a screenwriting book actually, as as is the other one I'm going to recommend here. Um, but I go back to that after I finish every book, and while I'm doing my revisions, I I keep what um, Iglesias has to say in mind to to large extent. And then the other book that I like, also a screenwriting book, and I like it from uh, the structure standpoint primarily and of moving the plot along and developing the characters is a book called Save the Cat by a screenwriter named Blake Snyder. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. Great book and, and recommended by many, many teachers and writers and wonderful. Okay. Yes. Terrific. And one last question before we launch into sort of some individual segments. Mm-hmm. Um and I think you've kind of answered this a little bit for me already, Laura, but um, are you, do you consider yourself a plotter, an organic writer, or a hybrid? I have been all three of those. Oh, uh, good. Okay. My first several books, I was a plotter. I outlined and I knew where everything was going. Um, those books remain unpublished. So oh. at, at one point, in fact, with uh, Swift Justice, which was the first in my private investigator series, um, I just sat down. I had a, an inciting incident in mind and and kind of couple of characters with some built-in conflict and I just sat down and started writing and that book sold. So I did that as an omen and for several years I was strictly an organic writer. I'd, I'd have a scene or two or whatever in mind, a couple of characters and I'd sit down and see what happened. Um, and now, especially with the standalone novels that tend to have multiple point of view characters and sometimes multiple timelines, you know, historical and present day, I do find myself um, using a hybrid method where I might have some outlining having to do with what's happening in each timeline and kind of keeping all that straight, um, but still doing a lot of the scenes kind of by the seat of my pants and seeing where the characters take me. Right. Well, that's, that's helpful to know. And that, that gives all of us who write and toil away in front of the laptop, some, some hope, I think. Well, um, I say, you know, the big, the big thing to take away there is that you don't need to be um, stuck with, with one approach to a novel, different novels um, can, can benefit by different approaches and that's you know you got to be give yourself the freedom to try to approach it differently especially if you're you know part way into a project and you're finding it's just not flowing well or you're not having fun do it doing it maybe if you're an outliner that's the time to toss away the outline and see what your characters have to say to you or maybe if you're a organic person and you've kind of ended up in a corner somewhere maybe that's the time to sit down and and outline a couple chapters um, just be open to what's going to work for a particular book. Very useful advice, and I think helpful to a lot of us. I'm going to launch into our individual segments now, and I'm going to share a statistic with you. It's quite an amazing one. 17 million minutes. That's right, 17 million minutes. An impressive number, and I'll tell you in a minute why that large number matters. Recently, I had the honor of being invited to a strategic planning session for the King County Library System here in the Seattle area. It was a look ahead to the future of what a library should be and could be, and King County Library Systems is one of the two largest, most heavily utilized library networks in the United States. The other one is in Brooklyn, New York. Libraries, in many ways, have become the heart and soul of many communities replacing the traditional pillars of community, such as churches, schools, and town halls. And libraries serve as a primary resource and learning center for many places. People now come to their local library to learn English as a second language, get tutoring to improve their lives, figure out how to write a resume, study, do research, and a whole lot more. They can download a book, King County Library Services has the most downloads of ebooks of any system in the U.S., or even check out a Wi Fi hotspot to take home to use. Because here in the land of Microsoft and Amazon, believe it or not, 25% of our local population does not have access 
That's a number that also surprised me. For example, with these mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, a working mom can take a hotspot home and complete her college assignments online at night when her kids are in bed, something I didn't even know about. So I guess you could say this is my public service announcement for supporting your local public library, wherever you live, be it through donations, volunteering, or fundraising. Libraries at their best are ways to ensure connection and wayfinding in increasingly complicated and chaotic times. And about those 17 million minutes, well, Teens and kids logged a record-breaking total of 17 million minutes of reading time during the 2016 Summer Reading Program with King County's library system. That big number shows the kind of impact that libraries can have on their community, making a difference and changing lives. I'm going to recall the quote from the character Hermione Granger in those Harry Potter books, when in doubt, go to the library. And now I'll turn it over to Wendy. Well, that's, that was a great announcement there, public service announcement, Julie. I, I just want to note as well, check with your employer because a lot of employers will match your donation to the library system. Or if you volunteer, they will uh, donate money to the library system that you're volunteering at. And I'm going to let you know, as if you don't know already, the best mysteries chill me entertain me, and also teach me about a world that I don't know, whether that world is real or made up. Putting the pieces of a puzzle together to determine for myself the killer has less allure when I'm already an expert in that world. I want to learn about an environment or a skill or a lifestyle or a profession that I know little or nothing about. And then I use that newly found knowledge as part of how I solve the crime. As Laura says on her website, I want to lose sight of the shore. This is certainly a component of Laura's books. Thank you, Laura. I learned so much reading yours. Another example I'll recommend to our listeners is Jeffrey Archer's False Impression. This murder mystery starts the night before 9-11. The twists and turns navigate through the world of art masterpieces. I really had a good time learning about the art world, and the intrigue also took me to exciting cities from New York, London, Bucharest, Tokyo, and more. Maybe I'm just lazy, but I like it when the author has done all the research for me, then leaves the duller facts on the cutting room floor and then layers the best information into an entertaining and exciting mystery so I can learn while I'm having a good time. So I recommend that you look for this depth in your mysteries as readers. It adds a valuable dimension to your sleuthing. And I'm going to give you another book recommendation too, The Prodigal Daughter, also by Jeffrey Archer. It's American politics, pursuit of happiness, and the American way, all wrapped up in a moving family saga. I just love this story of ambition and family ties. For irony, it's written by an English storyteller, and it hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list back in 1982. It's a timeless book, and its premise of who will be the first woman president of the United States has not yet been answered. You'll witness this Polish immigrant family saga in America in the 20th century through good times and rough times. Florentina is the cherished only child of Polish immigrants Abel and Sophia. Abel began work in America as a hotel busboy and you'll read of his meteoric rise working and learning the business and then heading up his own multi-city hotel empire. It's compelling to read of his dreams for his business and his other personal dreams and then see his actions and the consequences of those actions. As a baby, Florentina's first word is an attempt at president. That begins a recurring theme in her life. Reading of her childhood and seeing what incidents and which people shape her character and personality is fascinating. 
and she maintains an interest in politics and being the president. But destiny has its own path ahead, and there is a fork in it. A Romeo and Juliet family feud detour does not kill our heroine. Instead, it launches her very successful business career and her own family. She builds her business enterprise from the ground up. Her adult life is exciting, but being a prodigal daughter leaves an ache that is matched by the hole in her father's heart. Eventually, it's her time to enter into politics, and she does so with great enthusiasm. The author has said he's genuinely fascinated by America and would have loved to have been born here. He has many friends and contacts in national politics and Washington, D.C. who were helpful in how he shaped the story. The descriptions of the back room wheeling and dealing with people's loyalties will keep you on the edge of your seat, and characters' struggles with ethical questions and the lure of greed will have you cheering and jeering. Laura, what recommendation for a book has you cheering? Well, the, the book I read most recently that um, that I'd like to recommend is Garden of Lamentations by Deb Crombie, and I think it's the 17th entry in her Duncan Kincaid, Gemma James mysteries, and I have just been so swept up in the relationships that she has built over the course of 17 books that I was just really annoyed that she couldn't write faster and get that book out sooner. Um, I think it's almost almost two years from the one before it. But if, if readers or listeners, I guess, have not um, discovered that series, they're in for a real treat because the relationship goes from when Gemma and Duncan basically first meet um, their Scotland Yard detectives, well, off and on, um, and you know there were their romance blossoms, and you know they end up married, and then there are kids, and it's it's very just very engrossing to see how um, how Deborah Crombie keeps a series alive and interesting, and you know we've all read series where we kind of got bored with the character and their lives. Uh, you know, after five books or six or 12 or whatever. And, and yet she still um, has this vibrant community of people that I'm excited about going back to every time a new book comes out. So that's Garden of Lamentations. Great. That's one I'm going to have to look for. I've heard her name mentioned frequently in the, the recent past and still mm -hmm. haven't read any of her work. So I'm going to go right out and look for, look for one of those. My book recommendation is a recent one by the amazing veteran literary agent and expert fiction instructor, Donald Moss, a man that I consider to be a mentor. It's called The Emotional Craft of Fiction. And I think most of us who write want to touch and need to touch the reader's emotions. And that's why we read as well. This is especially true for mystery writers who deal with dramatic and out of the ordinary situations involving elements such as revenge, guilt, regret, innocence, and of course, murder. Don talks in his book about how to create an emotional response in your reader, something that connects you with them. We also need to understand that the reader's expectations for character, and this is something Wendy and I have actually talked about frequently in mystery workshops we've given. The fact is that the reader's expectations are different if you're writing a cozy mystery a traditional mystery, suspense novel, or a thriller. There is a difference, and writers need to understand why readers will fall in love with specific protagonists. Whether you're writing a standalone book or a series, that's what you want as a writer. And a side note, I confess I've signed up for Don's next class in September in Seattle on the emotional craft of fiction, and I can't wait. Two of his other books, if you're a writer or want to start writing, belong on your writer's bookshelf. They are writing the breakout novel and writing 21st century fiction. And I have one last shout out to a wonderful place that I discovered while on a writing retreat this last weekend. It's called Robert's Bookshop, and it's located on Highway 101 in Lincoln City, Oregon, a small beach community. And it looks like a small store from the outside, but when you walk in, you realize it's a series of interconnected buildings, a massive 
assessment and collection of used books of all kinds on every subject matter you can possibly imagine. And the thing that really makes this used bookstore unique is that Robert Portwood, who is the owner, has assembled an astonishing collection of original cover art for a wide variety of different genres of books. Everything from science fiction, military history, fantasy, romance, noir, you name it. Um, There are original illustrations that are framed hanging on the wall along with a reproduction of the actual book cover from which this illustration was, was developed. And um, it it makes it sort of a combination of a wonderful bookstore with very knowledgeable staff and an art gallery that's devoted specifically to cover art. So if you have the chance, check them out on uh, Highway 101 in Lincoln City, Oregon. And their website is robertsbookshop, all one word, dot com. And I think, Wendy, that just about wraps us up for the day. And Laura DeSilvio, I really want to thank you so much, DeSilvario, sorry, um, for your your time this afternoon and for sharing with us um, a a new work of women's fiction that you're working on. We're very excited about that. And without further ado, I think we'll uh, go out to our exit music. Thanks again. Keep writing. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.